Welcome to the TTS Talking Early Years podcast. Each week, we'll be joined by educational experts from across the globe, offering exclusive insights, inspiration, and guidance to help practitioners unlock the potential for learning in the early years. Hello, my name is Dr. Shadai Tambo, your host for this week's TTS Talking Early Years podcast. I am a lecturer in Early Childhood Studies at Bath Spa University and an Associate Lecturer at the Open University. I'm a trustee for the Fatherhood Institute and an independent speaker, writer and consultant for Critical Early Years. Throughout this series, we'll be exploring representation in the early years, inspiring you with guidance on ways to be more inclusive in your practice through covering topics such as cultural and gender diversity. I am delighted to welcome and introduce Dr. Sharon Collies as today's guest. Welcome to the podcast, Sharon. How are you today? I'm very well, Shadai. It's lovely to be here with you. Yeah, it's great. Hello. Yeah, I'm really glad that we can have this conversation today. But before we get started, perhaps you could give a quick introduction to yourself for the listeners. Yeah, my name's Dr. Sharon Colliers. I'm a senior lecturer and award lead at Bath Spa University. But I also sit as a trustee for Frobel Trust and an associate trainer for early education. Part of my work also involves uh, work with the Early Childhood Studies Degrees Network. Um, But I have a deep passion and interest in inclusivity. And that's where my research uh, lies, particularly around participation and approaches for supporting children's ethnic and race identity and their cultures in early childhood practice. So to kick off the first episode with you, Sharon, I'm really interested in talking about the current context of inclusive pedagogy and why that's so important. What does inclusive earliest practice mean to you? Well, for me, it's thinking about our youngest citizens. It's thinking about rights and their rights in early childhood. You know, we know that the UK is ratified by the UNCRC. And so for me, when we think about a curricula and inclusion, that sees children with Article 31, which speaks to play, which is part of my research. But what is particularly relevant for me in inclusion is Article 12, which gives voice and um, voice to children and their perspectives in decisions that are made about them within the curricula. So it's really about, for me, inclusion is about thinking about the diverse learner and what the curricula and what learning means for them in particular. So it's starting with that rights-based approach and also incorporating play as a vehicle for ensuring rights are maintained. Yeah, I think I really like what you're saying now about that that rights-based approach rooted in the United Nations Convention of the Rights of the Child. And that diverse learner as well, for me, feels really important when we're thinking about inclusive pedagogy. These are both topics that we are both really familiar with, but for someone perhaps not aware of inclusion and the need to talk about inclusion in the early years, perhaps those who might consider inclusion to be unimportant, how do you respond to those people? I think the response would be to think about the diverse learner as uh, as is with all children, needing to have a sense, a strong sense of self, a strong sense of their own identity and how they fit and how they can be seen in curricular approaches. So for me, if I was to talk about the early years foundation stage, which many practitioners will be working to, and the prime areas, I will be looking at a focus on personal, social and emotional development, because for me, that's where that's the primary focus before learning can begin. So the child needs to have a really strong sense of well-being and belonging, and particularly in a relationship of trust um, in those environments in which they are situated. So for me, inclusion is thinking about the parents and our parents are afforded a a dialogue, a conversation about their children and about what education in early childhood in particular 
where I'm not talking about those formal processes that kick in in primary education, but perhaps thinking about what should that environment look like for the diverse learner? Can they see themselves in the curriculum? And is their identity quite strong so that they feel included? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. And, and that focus on self and the need to address the emotional needs of the child before we go on to think about content such as maths, language, literacy, yeah. all those sorts of things. That foundation is so important for the child to develop a more inclusive way of being and for us to promote inclusive pedagogy as a whole. I also really liked what you were saying about the importance of the early years um, and how it's so fundamental that we get it right in those first few years of life. Perhaps you could just expand on that for listeners. Yeah, I think it's about igniting that curiosity and finding a space in which children can ignite that curiosity and are encouraged in play-based approaches to have conversations about themselves because what is very clear from my research is children are having those conversations anyway outside of the adult gaze. They are doing that and I suppose I'm drawing on my own lived experience which is where my research started. So from owning a private day nurse for myself and notice even noticing that even young children as young as eight months old were recognising difference. They would track me as I walked across the, the, the baby room or they would cry. So it's very clear children from a very young age are noticing difference. Or the why question be, when they become toddlers and the, and this idea that they will openly express, they will ask the questions that adults are a little bit fearful of asking to develop their knowledge. Children openly ask them. So, you know, I've had children telling me, you're categorically black. They have a sense, they use a language that is very different to the categorizations that you and I may know and understand. Mm. So I think that there's this idea of inclusion, which moves outside of a curricular framework, which is driven towards goals and attainment and readiness for much more formal processes of education. There's a need in that very early sense, and especially for children with multiple languages as well, because they're using different forms of expression and they're thinking about and making meaning of how they fit in the world. This is, these are the years, these are the wonder years as they call them, aren't they? So for me, it's about fostering that deep curiosity that children naturally have anyway. Yeah, you're absolutely right there. I really like what you're saying about children asking difficult questions sometimes of practitioners. Um, and I guess there's the importance there of practitioners being able to respond to those questions. Yeah. I know that you have a wealth of experience working in a range of nursery settings. Are we getting better at promoting inclusion and responding to those difficult questions with children? I think we have a way to go. I think, you know, unfortunately, in these times, we are dri very driven by a readiness of literacy, numeracy. Um, and we move towards that without thinking about the holistic child and what that means for them and their families, and especially children coming from disadvantage. So for me, I think that it's, it's, it's patchy, is what I would say from my experience and the work that I've been doing with settings. And it's also trying to get to a point where they, where settings can see a need for it, because I think Pedagogy believes that it does understand, but when I think about inclusion, it tends to, the rhetoric that goes with it is immediately send and not race or sexual orientation or gender and these real strong needs that are being explored by young children at a very early age. And that does not negate anything around children with additional needs. That's vitally important. But what I want to position is the vital importance of a child's race identity, their ethnic origins, the richness of what that can bring to curricula. Mm -hmm. So for me, that I don't see that that is, if I walked into a setting and I could see that a child, 
of a diverse background could see themselves immediately when you open the door and that children weren't having these conversations outside of the adult gaze, then I think we're there. But I'm not convinced that we are there yet, which is hence the need for podcasts like this and the work that we continue to do. We're still on that journey, Shaddai. Yeah, I would agree with you. We've, we have come a long way to an extent insofar as when we talk about inclusion, it's not just send children these days, but we, we do still have a long way to go with regards to that. I guess what comes to mind now is, is the role of policy and guidance and, yeah. and how effectively that can support inclusive practice. I wonder if you could just share your, your insight on, on what role policy can have towards supporting yeah, inclusion. Yeah, I think, yeah, sorry, Shaddai. I think policy has come a long way from the from working with you know, um, the early years foundation stage and that curriculum framework, it's much more explicit in its ex exemplification of what it means around minorities and minoritized groups. However, the gap for me is for the practitioner, the how question, how do we do that? So policy is there. We are aware we're working in a top-down policy framework. So for me, the, um, there is still a need to support practitioner understanding, to help them develop the knowledge around groups and groupings. And, and what is vitally important, and I think that this is the complexity in inclusion and, and policy and the need for policy to keep abreast, is that culture is not fixed. It's very fluid and it changes and it's changing rapidly as society, as we see migration, society, the British society is changing so drastically. And, you know, by time, by the time there's a policy review, culture and cultural context, <clears throat> excuse me, will look very, very different in society. And I think that that's the challenge for policies, keeping abreast of the fluidity of cultural context to then support practice that's yeah. where the gap is i would agree with that you, you know you're right to say that we are in a policy driven context and it is important to an extent but what's just as important is that policy is, is relevant and constantly related to the current challenges that we're facing with regards to inclusion i think should i what i would like to give to practice is that they have and I talked to a, a narrative that talks about power mm. and agency. And we've seen with the recent curricular reform that the policymakers are suggesting that the pedagogue is the expert, that the teacher is the expert, the educator is the expert. So what I'm asking practitioners to do is embrace that power that they have. Because in the day-to-day -day practice, when they are with the children, they can shape that curricula and those curricular programs around the children to best meet the needs of the children. So whilst policy is there and they know the girls that they're working towards, they have the power and the agency to shape what that looks like for the unique child. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those individual pra practitioners do have a lot of agency really in working yeah. with the children and knowing yeah. the child's best interests and best being able to support their, their needs with regards to inclusive practice. But there are some challenges there, aren't there? And I reflect back mm -hmm. onto my own experience as an early as practitioner where the kind of busyness of the nursery day, mm -hmm. by the time the parents have dropped off the children, nappy, circle time, snack, lunch, sleep, all of that and repeat in the afternoon. Inclusion often falls to the bottom of the agenda. Yes. Um, that's certainly a challenge that I felt as a practitioner. Yes. And I wonder if that's something that you've experienced as well. Absolutely. And that is where most of my work comes from now, is challenging those routines mm. and disrupting those routines in the sense of asking, if the routine has always happened that way, does it still need to happen that way? So do we need to have nappy changing where it's a part of a day? Can we disrupt that to think about, well, if we're addressing the need of the child, is there a need for a specific time of the day? Lunch breaks, do they need to happen in the way that they do? I'm acutely aware of ratios and working to ratio and the needs of the cook that might be in at a certain time of the day. But there are practices there that we could really look at 
that address different cultural contexts. For example, you know, many traditions eat with the hands, but yet we ask for this conformity of using a knife and fork. So in terms of transition and in terms of routine, it's exploring those routines to see where we can embed inclusion in a meaningful way. Yeah, I'd really agree with that. And, and certainly on, on that issue of routines, we have those strict kind of times in place where things can happen. It's often those children who are seen as out of sync that are tend to be labelled as uh, troublesome uh, because yes. they're not able to keep up with ultimately adult expectations of what has been set and what is expected of them within the nursery environment. So it is really, really important that we, we challenge that as much as possible. That links into the broader ways in which children are excluded within within their play. Um, and there are lots of different ways in, in which children are excluded in their play practices according to those different characteristics mm -hmm. on their identities. I wonder if you could just pick up and, and touch on that a little bit for the listeners. Yeah, for me, play is a vehicle for really connecting with the cultural context of children. It's a way, play is a vehicle and it's a lens into their thinking. And what my research offers is that children do not enter settings as empty slates. They enter settings with rich, and we've heard this terminology, so I'm hoping that practitioners will have an understanding of it, but they enter with funds of knowledge, rich funds of knowledge, knowledge that is learned through the cultural context of the families in which they live, the belief mechanisms within which they exist, and also the communities of practice, the communities that these children are existing in. So play is an ideal vehicle for connecting with. It can act as a cultural bridge between the play in the setting and the play that children are experiencing externally. And the best place to see that is in the role play because children then are enacting these rituals that they're experiencing externally. And I even saw it recently with a young child that disrupted the play and um, because they were singing Happy Birthday and they were singing it in English and this child disrupted it to sing it in, no, you must sing it, and she sang it in her home language. How wonderful is that to see that alive in play as a context. So yes, play is a vitally important um, context in which practitioners can em embrace issues around inclusion. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. observation. It's observation of how children make use of their play and how they deepen their own understanding through mm -hmm. play. Yeah, I'd really agree with that. That idea of play as a cultural bridge for me feels really important for practitioners to, to hold on to. But it's also the case that I think in the first instance, practitioners do need to be proactive with these sorts of issues, don't they? Yeah. Um, and often that can be the case in the first contact where parents come in and uh, show them around the nursery settings. Often that can be a really good opportunity to promote the values of the setting in terms of inclusive practice. Is that yeah. something you would agree with? I would agree with that, absolutely, Shada. Yes, it is. I mean, that's the first contact, isn't it? And what I speak to through my research is that practitioners need to take time to really know. And, you know, I'm not talking about their interests. Mm. What I'm talking about is understanding the cultural and ethnic identities mm. of the specific groups of children that they work with. And so for me, in the introduction packs, there's an opportunity. There's an opportunity to extend those boxes, to ask about the diversity, the different origins that the children are coming from so that the knowledge is extended. To also ask about the multiple languages that may be being used rather than one line, what language. So the, the, the parent, the carer, will just write one language where there may be multiple languages being used in the home context. So yes, those introductory conversations are so important, aren't they? Yeah. Um, because that's where you gather the knowledge. And uh, and I think and what I've spoken to is not seeing knowledge as being complete, 
it's a journey because your children will move on to another room and you're starting again. Um, so that knowledge is always ever expanding and it, it, it's multifaceted and it's multi-layered. So practitioners embrace that, embrace your developing knowledge and how you utilize it within your planning. I agree with you, Shaddai, yes. Yeah. Those conversations are key. And also listening. Listening is one context. Being heard is another. Mm -hmm. So it's shifting from listening to ha actually hearing the families and what they are saying and also hearing what the children are saying. So in practice, it's about noticing and then responding. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And what you're saying there about inclusion never being finished, not having an end point, it being an ongoing journey about understanding the child and the children within one settings who constantly change, constantly have different needs. For me, that feels really, really important. There's often this sense that we can complete inclusion, isn't there? But yes. we get all the right books on the shelves and, and that's our job done. But I think as you yeah. will understand, that's far from the case. It's absolutely far from the case. And, you know, if we think about, relationships and how those relationships have, and, and some of the um, celebrations that occur, Father's Day, Mother's Day, Parents' Day, shift, mm. it shifts, you know, those, it's moved and children are finding themselves in different groupings within their parents and they're really joyous about it. The children that I've worked with and the narratives that they use in my research, my two mummies, my two daddies, and celebrating that, you know, they're very, they've got a strong sense of their self and how they fit in society and society needs to move with that. And so practitioners can no longer stick to those traditional roles that they think they understand about a family makeup. They need to ask those questions, they need to embrace those questions because that's then how they can go on to support the child. So, you know, when you exclude a child because they may have two mummies because you're doing a Father's Day card, that's not taking away from celebrating Father's Day, which has just gone by. But it's also making sure that that child has an understanding that families come in different groupings now. And so that and so again, it's going back to that need for a conversation. I call it in my research, dialogic, dialogic conversations with children You'd be amazed. And obviously, you've got to think about the maturity of the child, so that maturation and their ability to have that understanding. Mm -hmm. But what I found fascinating through my research is that they had far more nuanced and complex understandings of contexts around inclusion than we give them credit for. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. I think children have a lot to teach us um, as adults as much as we think we can we can teach them. I think that's a really valuable place to to end this first episode on inclusive pedagogy. So thank you for that, Sharon. Thank you, Shadai. I would like to say a huge thank you to our guest, Sharon, for joining us and providing such valuable insights. You've been listening to TTS Talking Early Years podcast with me, Shadai Tembo and Sharon Collies. If you have been inspired by our conversation today, don't forget you can sign up via the link in our episode notes to be the first to hear about future episodes to access exclusive follow-up content, including ideas for your setting and links to relevant resources. Music